something that the town has been working on for quite a while. Uh, so what we're going to present is a preliminary design for connectivity, a multi-use pathway that runs down Route 360. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm the town administrator. Um, also with me is Kevin Brindle. He's an engineer with Barton with Judas. And then remotely we have Oscar, uh, who is a landscape architect, also of Barton with Judas, as well as John uh, Guskowski, who is the town planner. So what I'm going to do is go through, we've done introductions. I'm going to go through a little bit of background and talk to you about the complete streets planning that the town of Andover has done starting in around 2015. And then uh, Kevin is going to take over and go through the actual plan, uh, what it looks like on the ground and uh, what it will entail. And then at the end, John Gaskowski, hopefully you can get him to connect through and he will talk to you about the 2025 plan of conservation and development, which is coming up, and how that relates to this plan and complete streets planning in general. So this is us. We're a small town in eastern Connecticut, um, just under 3,200 people. We've currently got around 34 miles of roads and about five and a half miles of the Hawk River Trail, and then some more hiking trails. Um, as you all know, we live in a pretty rural town. We don't really have a true downtown center, and we've, ever since the advent of the automobile and the main thoroughfares through town, we've kind of cut the town into pieces, first by Route 6, and then also by Route 360. So, complete streets. Some of you may have heard the term, for others of you, it's a brand new idea, but basically complete streets is designing roads and transportation networks to work for everybody. So by everybody, I mean, certainly we mean automobiles, but we mean people on foot, people on bicycles, people that are disabled, um, people of all ages and all walks of life. And the goal is basically, to enable our road network to serve all of our residents, uh, regardless of what situation they're in. So, who needs complete streets? That's a question I got asked last week, like, who needs it, who cares? And let me tell you what it's about. It's about kids, um, it's about adults, it's about people who are wheelchair bound, it's pe about people who use walkers and need access to public buildings. Um, what it's not about is these guys down in the corner, which is the helmet wearing light bra, light bra uh, equipped um, bicyclists, which I am one too. But this is geared towards transportation, you know, not, I mean, it, there's a leisure component to it, but the primary, you know, isn't a bunch of sweaty guys rolling down the road with their heart rates at 187. It's about getting from point A to point B and making connections within the community. So, in 2015, the town completed a plan of conservation and development. And in discussions with the town planner at the time, one of the things we, the zoning commission recognized was that there was, the, the plan did not go far enough towards the complete streets and figuring out how to actually adapt a town uh, to be accessible to everybody. Uh, so, the other thing is we realized every plan of constant conservation and development since 1978 said the same thing. We need to make the town more walkable and likable, but we didn't actually do anything. So the Zoning Commission said, okay, if we want to actually do that, what do we have to do it? What are the steps? How can we write an actual plan? So we started with a survey of residents. Um, which was just asking people, you know, and observing and saying, okay, where do people congregate? Where are they coming from and where do they go to? Where do the kids need to go? You know, where do the kids ride their bikes now? And then saying, okay, what are the barriers to them getting there? 
and how can we remove those barriers and how can we make the whole town, you know, function uh, you know, with all modes of transportation, and that includes senior transportation too, which is an, an important part of complete streets programs. So I won't read this, but you know, this is a nice fancy way of saying that you know the town of Andover started with the major mode of transportation being the train. And then sometime in the 20s and 30s, we started switching over to the automobile as the primary transportation. Um, and at the time, the whole concept of transportation was get people from where they are to where they're going as fast as they can, make them straight lines, make big highways, you know, let's 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 go faster, 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 and push people farther and farther out into the suburbs. And then what they kind of realized is that that really created a two-tiered group, where you have people with automobiles and everybody else was kind of screwed. So, at its core, complete streets is the idea of reversing that and saying, okay, the streets and the roads have to work for everyone. So we started looking at it and saying, what were the major issues that we needed to address? Um, one of the primary ones is safe pedestrian and bicycle crossing of Route 6. As you know, most of Route 6 has a 50 mile an hour speed limit. But if you look at what the, uh, what's called the 85th percentile speed of that road, most sections of Route 6 have speeds around 60 miles an hour. Um, why is that bad if you're a pedestrian or cyclist? Well, I mean, it's a pretty stark number. If you get hit at 60, you got about a 5% chance of surviving a crash with an automobile. Um, so anything you can do to get people across six is worthwhile. And then we also looked and said, okay, what are we trying to connect? We're trying to connect the town's two major hubs. This is one. We're kind of referring to this as the municipal campus. So the new community slash senior center, the school, the town hall, the fire department. And then we have another area, which is the athletic fields, the church, the library, the museum that's separated. And the question is, how can we bring those together? So how can we get back and forth to them? Um, you know, we worked on a series of other things, pedestrian and bike safety in the Lake District. Um, you know, secure bike racks in all public facilities, um, route finding signage, so if you're on the trail or if you are walking or biking, you can identify where you are and where you need to go. So we talked a little bit before about Route 6, that red line is Route 6. It effectively cuts the town in half into a north side and a south side. Um, that's not new. Um, I grew up in the northern half of town, and the rule in my family was before I was 12, I could ride anywhere in town, but I couldn't ride across Route 6. So I had to run on the north side of the town, um, but I couldn't get to the lake. Um, along with it, we also have the rail trail, which runs roughly parallel to that. That's the green line. So it's both a barrier, but right next to it, you have an opportunity. So some of the other things we did, talking about the Lake District, an effort to make the lake itself more walkable and bikeable through shadows and signage and public awareness. Um, we've also, whenever we're doing tree trimming at or near pedestrian crosswalks, we've been very good about pushing the vegetation back and making sure we have appropriate sight lines so the crosswalks that we do have are safer both on the rail trail and elsewhere in town. And then similar to the one out front, putting bike racks in all public buildings. So if you show up to the library or show up here, you have a secure bike rack to attach or to park at. So the first major project we took on was we applied for and received a grant from the Department of Transportation called the Connectivity Grant. Um, and the idea of that was, was to do two or three things. The first was to reestablish a safe crossing of Route 6 at Long Hill, because that then allowed transit to the library and also the athletic fields and the Hawk River 
and the Andover Congregational Church. Uh, at the same time, we established a new trailhead at Center Street. Um, we did that actually because one of the feedback we got from a fair number of people that were trail users was that they didn't feel that the existing trailhead at the museum was safe because it was too secluded and they were parking at Center Street anyway. So that was kind of an aha moment for us and we said, okay, well that sounds like a great place for a trailhead. And so we established that with some amenities. Um, and at about the same time, we started reaching out to Department of Transportation as well as our legislators trying to address Route 316 because that was one of the other things that we saw that was a major impediment to transportation in the town. It's very narrow, speeds tend to be fairly high, lousy sight lines, not a particularly safe place to walk uh, or bicycle. So we've actually been working on this again for nine years. Uh, in this year, I got a, the Connecticut State Legislature to give us a study grant to do the initial design, which we're doing with Barton and LeJudas. Um, that was my fourth uh, grant I wrote for that, but it was the first one that got funded. So these are some of the things we've done so far in terms of implementation. Um, at various <coughs> areas. You know, we're not trying to say the same solution is going to work everywhere in town. And a lot of the low speed, you know, cul de sac roads with cul de sacs and things like that really don't need anything because the speeds are already low enough that they're fairly safe for walking and biking. So we're really focused on the major connections in town. So looking at Route 316, there's just a couple pictures of Route 316. We just randomly uh, saw a pedestrian walking down and took a bunch of pictures. Actually, that turns out to be Ed Sirisley, um, for those of you who know. But you can kind of see how bad both the sight lines are and you know how narrow the roads are. Those are already basically at the DOT minimum road width. Um, we have approached DOT twice. We made them do a traffic study in Route 316. And then we also formally requested that they widen this curve and a couple other curves as part of their VIP paving. Um, but both times, um, DOT has said no. Um, their argument, you know, frankly, is that there haven't actually been any fatalities on the road. And unless there's a crash history where fatalities are produced, it's not going to reach their priority to address. So that comes to the, the second part of this with Kevin is going to take over and talk you through the, the planning and then the design of this route. Um, and then we'll turn it over to uh, John and Just to ask, let's sit down on the first slide. All right. Thank you all. Um, it's always nice to see a lot of faces when we spend a lot of time preparing for these public informational meetings. It's nice to, or nice to see that you've all made time on a Tuesday evening to come out. Like Eric said, my name is Kevin Rendell, an associate with the firm of Barton and Judas, uh, formerly Anchor Engineering. The uh, firm has been in, uh, in Connecticut since 1993. I've been with the firm for 23 years. A lot of what we do is transportation, transportation corridors, both on road and off road. And tonight, obviously, we're discussing on road and all of that. Sidewalks, complete streets, less uh, less focused on the vehicle and more focused on the pedestrian. Um, usually, when we're talking about corridor studies, uh, state highways, design vehicles, those design vehicles, like Eric said, are going 50, 60 plus miles an hour. I have the opportunity this evening to talk about a design vehicle that's pedestrian, that's, that's a human being, or a bicyclist. Somebody who's appreciating that corridor on a different level, not going 50, 60 miles an hour, not, not getting through town as fast as they can. Uh, the point here is getting people from this municipal campus uh, down to the Hot River Trail, down to Route 6, down across Route 6, uh, to the church, to the library, to the rec, uh, rec fields, like Eric was saying. So, that became you know, our charge 
from day one, um, when we were hired, the point was to get pedestrians safely between those two locations. Like Eric said, working with the DOT, the DOT is very, uh, very car-centric. Uh, the past few years, that is changing, uh, and, uh, and we on the design side, design community, uh, are, are, are welcoming those changes. But historically, the DOT has been um, very centered on the, on, on the vehicle. So getting them on board with a project like this, like Eric has said, has taken a very long time. And we're still working through those design elements. Where we are in the design process, these plans here this evening, uh, this overall corridor, uh, bottom of the screen is the, uh, let me see if I've got a pointer on it that may or orient better. Bottom of the screen is, yeah, I'm sorry, that. That the shelf of the screen, not surprising. Uh, bottom of the screen is the municipal campus where we are right now. Top of the screen is the Hot River Trail, Route 6 across six. So our charge is to get to the Hot River Trail. From the Hot River Trail, we access the existing trail. And apart from that, we get across Route 6, to get our a successfully completed project. So in doing that, uh, taking advantage of right of ways where we can, and discussing the property owners, the opportunities for both some temporary easements during construction and some permanent easements to get this corridor uh, constructed uh, as you see it here. So what I will do is go through kind of a high-level perspective of how we got to where we are. And uh, if technology allows, uh, my colleague will go through the details plan by plan uh, at, a, at a fairly quick clip understanding that there's only so much you can glean off the screen that we're looking at, uh, but just to give you an understanding of the, level, of the level of detail that we've looked at thus far. So again, top to bottom, what you see there in red is about half a mile, that section along 316. The section that you see in blue is along Cyber Mill, taking advantage of a low volume local road to make that connection. Uh, also, taking advantage of getting people off of Route 316 in a section that is particularly tough to get uh, safe pedestrian access through. And that becomes our initial charge here throughout, is that safe pedestrian access. Um, understanding we've all been on sidewalks, those sidewalks be right next to the road. In many cases, those sidewalks right, in, right, in, right across the road or right adjacent to the curb line. Um, serve the purpose of getting you off the physical travel life, but don't really serve the purpose of making you feel all that safe when you have the right cars going by you at 40 to 50 plus miles an hour. So what we're looking to do, to do is separate as best as possible, even further from the edge of the travel life. And in doing that, also producing a snow shelf as, as, as a grass barrier, grass buffer. Um, the term snow shelf obviously tells you that we're in the front of the snowy winter again, uh, having that opportunity for some, some snow storage before it's piling directly onto this, uh, this, this, this pedestrian way. So, let's see, there we go. Did I skip one or two? There we go. Okay. So, again, fairly, fairly zoomed in here, and, I, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the, some of the imagery, and while I'm not going to go through the details, uh, if, uh, if the zoom technology allows us. So in doing that, in separating this pathway from the road, a couple different opportunities, recognizing we're trying what we can to stay within the state right away, recognizing the DOT is a partner in this project and eliminating the impact to the private properties along the state highway, looking to do it, also recognizing we also have uh, water crossings, both wetlands and water courses. So that, and again, this is the zoomed in, this is the top half. So you see from where we are, are at School Street and Town Hall, bottom of screen, top of screen, you see that very, very light or very short blue line is the beginning of Cyber Mill. So through this quarter, wetlands, recognizing we can't go through and disturb wetlands in a significant manner. Those wetland locations are primarily adjacent to School Street, that bottom right hand picture effectively bringing the trail further off the roadway and elevating it under a boardwalk section getting you through a wetland location. A, that's serving this wetlands and it goes to not making additional disturbance within those wetlands, but also recognizing we have the opportunity that this is, you know, this is a pedestrian corridor in some manner where we're trying to get people away from the road where possible. This is one of those locations that adjacent to a town on a nature preserve 
frosting wetlands for taking the opportunity to direct team through and then a little boardwalk, a little more scenic, a little more, or I should say a little less uh, vehicular centered travel way. Coming up, the middle of that, uh, the middle of that screen on the road, right, that is in essence what we're trying to achieve in the majority of this corridor. That snow shelf that you see on the left hand side of that image, that grass corridor or that, that grass shelf plus or minus five feet in width, and the paved section of that pathway uh, between six and ten feet wide. Ten feet wide is the optimal, uh, optimal width of a shared use pathway, allowing two bicyclists to cross or, 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 or pedestrians to walk two abreast in both, in both the directions. Recognize that we don't have that opportunity in front of many of the residences here based upon the location of the houses to the proximity of the houses to the street. We're understanding that, reducing that to a minimum of six feet wide, that six foot path would be the minimum required to pass uh, cyclists or pedestrians. So uh, taking into consideration the proximity to those houses, reducing the pathway width uh, to accommodate those, uh, those locations. That image on the top, Understanding we're crossing South Brook, we're crossing a couple smaller tributaries. There are pedestrian, uh, pedestrian bridges on this, uh, on this project. Uh, you will see them as you go through. And again, hopefully Oscar will be able to get through those detailed plans. If not, I will run through them as well. Uh, but a couple of large, uh, large water crossings. Uh, those pedestrian bridges uh, to span the water, the wetlands, and associated floodplains. We're talking two bridges in the 80 to 90 foot width. So two significant spans of pedestrian bridges to, uh, to, to achieve this. So second half, again, orientation at the Lucas Cyber Mill. You see the connection in to uh, the Stadelbrook crossing on the bottom, and then that red component that brings you back up uh, to the Hop River Trail, or I should say up to the Hop River Trail. Um, Again, pedestrian bridges are, cent are centered in this location. We've got another pedestrian crossing, a pedestrian bridge crossing in Stout Park down adjacent to the Hop River Trail. Uh, that image on the top right, that's just a screen grab of what the Hop River Trail would look like. Most people in this room have either been on it or are familiar with it. Uh, that is the connection we're trying to make. Uh, that connection uh, goes without saying, as far as pedestrian access for access for pedestrians and cyclists, I should say. Uh, once on the Hop River Trail, heads into Willimantic, connecting with the airline trail, heads out to Fulton Notch to, to the Charter of Greenway. It really puts Andrew literally on a map. And that point is, you know, we can, we can go through the census data for trail users um, all day long to go blue in the face, but both Eric and I being avid cyclists, um, we really rely on those trails, both on road and trails, um, to make those connections to and from Andover. So, we really feel strongly that this connection into the Hop River Trail um, really makes the town more accessible and through conversations with DEP as well as DOT, making these connections up to the municipal campus here uh, opens, opens a real dialogue with DEP as far as uh, you know, access and, and access to trail users and, uh, and, and this campus specifically. So that bottom right image, um, again, that's a that's a perspective of something that you would imagine to see on Cyber Mill. Cyber Mill is a very low volume local road, and the intention here is it would be an on road use, uh, directing residents, pedestrian, uh, cyclists to use the on road component, take advantage of the narrow width, low traffic volumes, low traffic speeds, and uh, you know, in conversation with Eric and with the town as far as what we can do to that for that road and to the residents of that road uh, to promote the you know, safety of the residents, safety of the users of that road, and recognizing that that would be a key connection to get people off of 316 and make this connection back down to the Hop River Trail. Those images, those images that, you know, these are the things that we keep bouncing around in our mind when we start designing pro projects like this. Okay, is it gonna be an on-road component? Uh, those chevrons on those top two photos, um, be it bikeways, bike lanes, uh, sheros, chevrons that need that, that you know, uh, cyclists present on the road right. Um, where needed, where possible, uh, that is something that we use. Uh, but also recognizing that those, we can in good faith say to cyclists and the community that we're going to promote that level of use out on 316. It doesn't meet the DOT warrants for traffic speed, the traffic volumes, and uh, the, as Eric had said, we don't have the paved width to reduce the travel lanes on 316 and provide 
for the required five foot shoulders for the bike lanes on that by way. So um, those two top images were all very nice to see. I'm putting bring them up there because just to identify the fact that we've looked at them and they really don't pertain to this project. And that's the reason we've now gone to the next phase where it becomes the images on the remaining uh, remaining portions of that screen by saying it really does become an off-road uh, within the right way where possible, but it's an off-road component where uh, we're separating the users from the, uh, from the vehicles. So for perspective here, uh, we've come up with this slide and the next, uh, just for graphical purposes. Now, recognizing this is still in preliminary design phases. Um, and I am getting ahead of myself by just saying that the next phase here would be full scale survey, full scale site design, and the semi final and final design component through DOT, uh, through, through DOT permitting. So, uh, mind you, this, this and the plans that we're showing are really just conceptual in nature for, for tonight's conversation. But this, in, in order of magnitude, is what you would be looking at for this corridor. You know, the, the, the previous couple slides were just, uh, you know, images from other locations, uh, be it some of our projects and some just uh, stock images of that, that we draw from. But this becomes what, what it would be landing, or, or how it would be landing through this corridor. And you do see that there are sections that we would be taking advantage of wide borders, the bottom two images, where there are existing stone walls. We would be maintaining those stone walls and be working within the right of ways. Um, those top two images would be working with existing utility poles and bringing that into a narrow environment down to a six foot pathway to try and work with the existing conditions, maximize the, the lawn areas that are existing, bring, bring the trail section as close to the road as possible while still leaving uh, that grass shelf. And, and, and trying to split the difference between uh, you know, working within the right of way and really trying to minimize any disturbance within those bike properties. Uh, next slide again, just two more images. Here recognizing that there are some locations that would require vegetation, uh, vegetation to be removed. Uh, what we would be doing is working with the property owners. Most of them we have met with and discussed these items. Uh, those that we have not met with, we will be doing <coughs> But understanding that there's opportunity to remove some you know, vegetation, be it uh, if it's preferred vegetation, we would be replacing it in kind um, with either you know the citrus, flower, and evergreens. You know that would be the conversation with the property owners and the uh, community, uh, as well as if there are any hazard trees or any dead or deceased trees within that corridor, we'd be in a position to be working with DOT to be removing those as part of this project and and, and providing an enhanced corridor. Once, uh, once the project was complete. So, and again, you do see, um, and again, these are, these are quick and dirty. Um, this, this, is, this is for, for tonight's conversation so that you begin to understand what we're looking at on, on these next couple two-dimensional plans. Uh, but understanding that there's uh, some, some locations that are grade changes, um, we would be mitigating, mitigating those grade changes so that this uh, pathway would be an accessible route uh, following the grade of the road would not be undulating up and down uh, through, the, uh, through the existing grade that you would see out there today, um, but also working with the property owners to then minimize the impact to their, uh, to their properties. Um, right now, we believe we can do this without retaining walls, but that's a conversation to be had during the final design phase if there would be retaining walls involved um, within the state right of way. Obviously, that's a, that's a lengthier conversation with the OT, uh, but one that would be had if need be. So, from there, I will say, and forgive me, Oscar, there's an opportunity, I'm not sure if you're seeing any additional uh, screen share or additional slides, but, and you can try out the audio. If it works, I can, uh, if you can tell me to uh, shift or, or, or toggle through slides and you can talk. Sure. Or, uh, can it, can you, how does the audio sound? Can you hear me? Can we press it? Perfect. So, all right, so these are the drawings that uh, were submitted uh, to the lots of, uh, lots of application. Uh, I'll run through them. Um, uh, I guess you have a pretty good, pretty good understanding of our route. This is uh, the rural key map that shows uh, the end of our route. Um, but uh, I'll look at it in a little more detail. Um, I'd just like to note that you know, we're able to, uh, to work on these plans using uh, standard available uh, data, uh, wetlands data, area images, contours, property lines. We dig. Uh, we we'll verify the property lines along Route 316 so that we know exactly where the path 
files and relationships with property rights. What we're looking at here is uh, the south section from the fire station to Stubbrook. We'll look at we'll look at uh, the present a little bit more detail further on. The lower one shows uh, the northern section connected to the end of a bridge. This is a starting point at the fire station and uh, the connection to Hebron Road at the bottom that Kevin mentioned that we have environmental constraints, uh, one being uh, some existing drainage, uh, drainage areas and a uh, wetland area. We, uh, we decided to uh, implement a uh, raised boardwalk under the wetland, as Kevin said, uh, in order to maintain all the other drainage patterns uh, as in, uh, the way they are now. As we move forward, as we, as we move north on the trail, we, we come across other constraints, grading being one of them. We do have a couple of holes that, that, we, that will require grading, but we'll uh, worry about that. This is a close up of boardwalks, and you can see the uh, the existing drainage swell, the wetland, and there's also a culvert extension. A couple of culvert extensions will be required for us to be able to place the, the, the trail uh, closer to the road. As we move north, uh, we're able to maintain a parallel relationship with the 360, and that is our intent. Uh, Here we have another culvert crossing that uh, an, another culvert extension is required, and this is where uh, the transition of the trail goes from 10 feet to 6 feet. This is due to the proximity of, of some of the residences to the road. We wanted to minimize the disturbance into the, to the long areas. As we approach uh, Stadler, we are we're able to maintain that five foot relationship with uh, Hebron Road, and then eventually. Uh, Cross the pedestrian bridge to reach the second right portion of the trail. This is a close up uh, so you can see the relationship of the trail with uh, the existing residences. Um, the amount of disturbance that's required, we try to keep the, uh, the elevations as close to uh, the road elevations as possible, but we will also uh, need to relocate a couple of utility poles that are, that are in the way. And uh, as well as uh, we need, we need a couple of uh, properties. As the trail does straddle the property line at certain areas, there are about four, four properties that, that will require any space for us to be able to be able to place a trail in. Here's a close up of the other bridge at Stilebrook. Do you can see that we, we do cross a couple of driveways and then uh, eventually make our way uh, to? The, uh, yeah, we connect with the northern, uh, the last section of the trail at the cemetery, Sirenville, uh, Sirenville and the Hebrew Road at the cemetery. Uh, and in this, in this location, the main constraint was a great differential that we had to contend with. The existing properties sit approximately three or four feet lower than the road, so a retaining wall will be required to raise the trail to the road elevation. So you see here, we, we're, you know, we're proposing a retaining wall that will be approximately three feet high, um, as well as uh, uh, some drainage improvements. In this case, uh, uh, we're proposing a couple of inlets, inlets, drainage inlets that will capture the water, the run off water from the road, and daylight it through the wall into an existing, an existing swell that we are preserving. Uh, so the, the, the retaining walls also help us preserve that existing drainage pattern. Style book with another pedestrian bridge, we reached the last section of the trail that requires a little bit more uh, earth moving in order to uh, accommodate a gentle transition up to the trail. We're looking at approximately 20 feet of the grade differential between the Snipe Brook and the Hop River Trail elevation. So we are uh, proposing some retaining walls since most of the earth work involves cutting in order for us to get it. Uh, a ramp section. Um, we try to minimize the, the steepness of the, of the ramps and we worked out a, uh, a gradient of 1 in 12 or 8 percent 
and I think divided into 50 foot sections with, uh, with level landings. So hopefully, yeah, that'll give you an overview of, uh, of, of what we're proposing and then uh, this John can take over from here. Does this look like, uh, if, first of all, can everyone hear me? And second, does this look like a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> yes and yes. Okay, great. Um, so again, uh, folks, I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. Um, for folks I haven't met yet, my name is John Wiskowski. I'm the town's uh, consulting town planner. Uh, and uh, where are we? In March, I began uh, in the fall um, to assist the community uh, of Andover primarily with the initial task of uh, completing the plan of conservation and development, but also working closely with um, Eric's office on various grants and special projects, um, this, this trail being one of them. Um, the trail is, in fact, um, as Eric noted in his, his, his beginning uh, remarks, that this is actually the implementation of goals and, and plans that were established through the prior plan of conservation and development, the one that was adopted in 2015. Um, and, and it coming to life in many ways is um, is, is a, a tribute to the fact that the previous plan, which is the current uh, town plan, um, envisioned this and, and made a priority of creating uh, multi-use pathways and safe opportunities for people to access multiple municipal facilities without having to either walk a dangerous road or get in a single-family vehicle. Um, so creating these, these transportation alternative options was very much a priority of the current climate conservation and development. Uh, but it is now time, and I'm going to just sort of take this, this meeting as an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about plans of conservation and development in general, because we have, through the Planning and Zoning Commission, started to update this, uh, because a plan of conservation and development needs to be adopted every 10 years by a municipality. It's a 10-year plan. So 2020, or 2015 to 2025 is the current um, Time frame and the Planning and Conservation, the Planning and Zoning Commission are looking to adopt a new plan uh, effective 2025, and that will take us through to 2035, if you can believe it. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Uh, Planning and Conservation and Development is mandated by the state of Connecticut. Again, every municipality produces one at least every 10 years. There are a few things that it must do, and I would, um, so it's Broadly speaking, it's a system, a statement of policy, goals, and standards um, for, the, for the physical and economic development of the community. The very next statement is that it must provide for a system of principal thoroughfares, parkway bridges, street sidewalks, multi purpose trails, and other public places appropriate. And so, in, in, in very specific uh, terms, we saw how the 2020, 2015 Planet Conservation and Development is now being realized because we have identified the importance of multi-use trails that allow for circulation in town, safe travel through town, um, and, and we're carrying this forward. And again, it takes a look at things like coordinated development, the general welfare of the community, desirable use of land, should a piece of land be developed, should it be pres preserved or protected, desirable residential densities of the town, and inconsistencies um, with state growth management principles, which can generally be thought of as smart growth principles, which is redevelopment and, and uh, develop and revitalization of commercial centers um, is more appropriate than extending infrastructure to areas that aren't previously developed, water housing opportunities, building along major transportation corridors and nodes, conservation of critical resources, um, and protection of the environment. Um, a couple other things that the plan must consider is development of housing opportunities. Um, and, and the town uh, recently adopted, or you know, a little over a year ago, adopted um, its uh, first affordable housing plan, um, which also included a provision for multi-family housing uh, in terms of a, a conceptual um, goal setting. Um, promoting housing choice and economic diversity in housing, considering the needs of older adults and people with disabilities, and certainly we, we saw um, in some of our demographic analysis in, in Andover that Andover is an aging population and uh, the needs of seniors and um, will become increasingly important over the next decade. Um, so those are things that, that, that a plan of conservation development must address. There are a few optional things 
such as conservation of, of, of trap rocks and ridges, consideration of airports, parks, playgrounds, public uh, amenities, schools, public buildings, public utilities, and any public housing, uh, and then as well as identifying specific actions, potential budget implications, how will we go about implementing these things. And as I said, we are in the process, we're in the early stages of developing the vision um, and the uh, priorities for the next 10 years. Um, and we have not yet, if you were not aware, um, the Planning and Building Commission is undertaking a survey of uh, Andover residents, Andover employees. Um, and uh, it's, it's available both online. Um, I don't know, you can take out your phones and start to scan the screen right now. Um, or you can take note of uh, the website, um, which is surveymonkey.com slash r slash andover POC, POC meaning plan of conservation development. Uh, we've had, uh, so the survey has been up for about three weeks or so. Um, we've had just around 180 um, responses so far. This ad um, is going to be posted in the uh, River East over the next couple of weeks, and hopefully we will generate a little bit more interest. But um, the survey, again, attempts to gauge some public interest in several different areas and forces some choices and forces thoughts about what our priorities are. This is a, 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 a screenshot from the survey itself, um, looking at questions of community resilience and state sustainability. It identifies seven potential priorities and asks you, uh, as a survey response, to rank them. So is alternative energy something that the town should be um, investing in or focusing on? Or upgraded power and data infrastructure? Or making sure that town roads are safer to uh, bicycle congestion, like this project is proposing? Community gardens, um, creating infrastructure for recreational resources, or upgrading roads and bridges, that sort of thing. So it creates a ranking that through public uh, participation in the survey, we'll get a sense of what people believe are important and where we need targeting um, community resources. Similarly, um, we look at issues of conservation. And so we, we identify um, you know, seven categories of uh, the conservation and recreation uh, investments, such as focusing on Andover Lake, looking at trails, stewardship of existing open spaces, um, active you know, habitat land field, passive open space such as forest, um, or looking at hopper or trail systems. So again, wanting to gauge where people's priorities lay. Um, I would note know two things. Number one, this is a very important um, piece of community input and a really great opportunity for the community to have their voice heard in the process. The other thing I would note is that this is not, the survey is not a binding referendum. Um, it's an absolutely critical element of um, input for the, plan, for the planning and zoning commission who are ultimately going to be drafting the plan. But there are other very important considerations, um, input from key stakeholders. So, you know, input from the Board of Education on, on the school resources, input from the Economic Development Commission on, on growth and, and encouraging development, the Conservation Commission on open spaces and parks, um, as well as fiscal reality. You know, we could say, you know, we could hear from the public that 100% of people want, you know, um, a, an Amazon Global headquarters, you know, located on the six, but you know, um, economically, market-wise, that's not going to happen. So um, the, pop, the most popular answer isn't always the right answer, but that's the charge of the Planning Conservation and Development um, and the charge of the Planning and Zoning Commission in this process. So we would very strongly encourage you to participate if you have not yet in the survey. Um, and so the process is basically the Planning and Zoning Commission is going to develop uh, process of community vision, the, the survey being one uh, element, talking through stakeholder groups, uh, doing through the graphic investigation, um, and understanding where we fit in terms of market and, and aging and all of those things, um, create a vision for the community where we want to see and over over the next 10 years. And then we'll establish a series of goals, um, whether it's preserve more open space, invested you know, roads and bridges, uh, and then each of those goals will have a specific set of actions, whether that's changing zoning regulations, providing some tax incentives, um, you know, setting aside funds for open space acquisition, uh, providing more services to seniors, whatever those, those actions are. 
um, and then we create one. Um, and then that plan is used in a couple of different ways over the next 10 years once it's adopted. Um, first, it's used in directing municipal investments. Again, um, as we've seen this evening, uh, the plan of conservation and development goals from 2015 identifying the importance of long use trails and state vehicle, uh, state, you know, bicycle and pedestrian passage from you know, Route 6 and the Hop River Trail um, to the, the, the community campus um, was an important goal. And that has directed the municipal investment and has directed in many ways the state investment because it's a local priority. We put those things in grants, and the state has provided funding for, for these opportunities. And then the other place that it um, is seen is in regulations and that changes. So if, if you know the community goals are to provide more housing opportunities and to make it easier to develop uh, accessory apartments or multi-family housing in certain areas of town, that requires a regulation change. Those only regulations will have to change, um, and, and those changes should be guided by the vision of the plan of conservation and development. Um, so again, we are, we are uh, this, is, this is a very important plan, having um, a large amount of community input and participation at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, uh, which is the third Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock. Um, public participation is, is, public attendance is welcome and participation. Um, we're still in the very early stages of this, and we'll be writing um, plans for the next year. And, Certainly hope that people get engaged because a plan that gets written today will get implemented over the next 10 years and create more projects like we discussed uh, this evening. So that's that's my bit. Uh, that's my pitch, and I thank you uh, for your time. You know, we're certainly willing to sit down with anybody that wants to look at the plans in depth. Um, the plan set is online on the town's website, and so really we're just looking for feedback from the community at this point. So I'll open it up to the floor. Sure. Minor question is, uh, it looks like the, the, the new trail would meet the existing Hop River Trail on the town hall side of the bridge. That is correct. Okay. So the reason that was done is when the uh, covered bridge was put in, on one side of the road, you have essentially large-scale three-phase power, and on the other side of the road, you have a major fiber optic bundle and communication wires. So putting a pathway alongside 316 under the bridge is really problematic just because there's so much sensitive data connections under there that we kind of ruled that out as a realistic possibility and therefore we tried to design it to go uh, you know just this side of the trail and make the connection there. Sure. I thought it was a really nice presentation and uh, they do the survey online. It's really easy to go through. Thank you. And, and to do that. Uh, what I haven't seen is any data or information relating I know we want to connect it to town parts been here a very, very long time, and it's been a, a dream of many people to do that. I get it. But uh, has anyone ever looked at how the volume of, of interest of going down, uh, down 316 to go visit the museum or go to the fields? Um, you know, I've lived there for a long time, 27 years. Sure. And, uh, never had a trick or treat. So that got to start investing in candy now pretty much with the trail of that I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, the question I have is, is, you know, is it a build it and they will use it kind of a thing? So that's a really good point, and, and that's something that's debated commonly in kind of transportation nerdy circles. And so the the data in areas that have put in standalone bike pet infrastructure have led to really significant increases in traffic through it. Are we going to get a thousand people walking up 316 every day? No, but we're going to get a lot more than we are now. So do I have exact numbers? Nope. I don't think there's any way to generate it because right now 316, it's like saying how many people 
would walk down I-84? The answer is nobody, um, unless they're nuts. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my answer to that. I could go. I went down there up between the cemetery and the trail. I've been working from home as much as I can. And over the last couple of years, uh, especially in the summertime, I will see easily, these are just people that I see, a dozen, 20 people a day, which crossing my driveway there, cemetery down towards the road. Where they're going to and from, I have no clue. Uh, there are definitely a lot of bicyclists on the weekend who are going down and then meeting the trail. Um, and I know since we're coming up on Memorial Day, especially that last half of uh, Port Minor or so, gets a lot of pedestrians for the uh, break. So some of it I definitely agree is a how much, but there's also a room for expansion because it will be safer for people to do so. And I think that's a strong, you know, strong conversation that we had to the parallel on the multi-use pathways through the state. The you know we common trail census data. Um, those trail census data stations throughout the state, you can see spikes when the gaps and trails are closed. So that as you know, I'm thinking about the airline trail, where as gaps in the airline trail get closed, you've got people who could now go from East Hampton to Colchester, or from Colchester to Willamette. As those gaps close, you see the trail census spike in, 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 in users. Um, and something like this, um, Eric's right, we don't know how many people will be using this. And, that, and that's tough to extrapolate out, because it is not some place that is friendly to be currently. And what we're trying to do is make it a safe space. And once we make it the safe space, recognizing the bill that you will if you build it and they'll come, you know, that, that's an overused reference on our behalf, kind of saying, trust us, it'll work. But there is that component that says, uh, you know, the, again, the, the, the user group that we want to be taking advantage of this, frankly, right now, if they need to go to the trail at school, they're going to drive. So what we're trying to do is get people out of their cars and onto these trails. And in doing that, that's a very difficult model for us to extrapolate out during this phase. Sure. Hey, Eric. Um, as you know, I've been asking you a couple of questions about this and very interested, so I wanted to make sure that I made it tonight. One of the questions that we really do want the community to support and everything and to hear about it is why didn't we, I, I only found out about it today through another person. I listened to the Board of Selectmen. This isn't confrontational. Sure. Because clearly I'm here to understand and want to learn. Um, as a member of one of the boards in town. But why didn't we talk about it last night at the Board of Selectmen meeting? Why didn't we use our informational system that we have in the town to blast it out? You know, I just think it's important because I truly, you know, take the town's input and the community members' input about a project like this. I'm glad to hear that it could be financed through grants, as you know. Um, I'm one of the people that knows we already have a lot of existing trails in town know that we live in such a small community and I really want to commend our planner too because every meeting I go to that he is here and, and yourself um, sir too um, really makes it very understandable you know to what we're trying to do but again I really think it would have been great for the town to hear about it a little more um, because that's my angle is I want to hear what the people say about it 316 always scared me. I know we've had, you know, clearly this is walkable. I'm worried about the people whose property is going to be changed. So I don't know if they're sitting in this audience. I wanted to hear their feedback. Um, yeah. I mean, it's nice in concept. I'm a walker, so I love to walk. But I also go visit people who live in walkable towns where there's little bistros or, you know, coffee shops and that kind of thing, and I wonder too, are we all going to walk to the church? Are we going to walk to the, you know, I don't see a big need for them in a small town, but I'm, I'm listening, and it's a beautiful concept, so that's all. I, I like the information to get out to the people when we have a meeting like this. Sure. Mercy? Uh, I can think of several instances where I would have used it. Um, lots of times wanted to go around the area and uh, just riding my bike and walking. 
And uh, so I went 12, we got to take 316, you know, maybe we'll do the school shorts. You know, sometimes we would do a short trip from the school road to Lake Road. But even then, you know, we're always like, you know, trying to make sure we're going fast and being careful. Uh, but anyway, and also I, I agree with um, that I'm surprised that we didn't hear about this. I found this on a Facebook page, a Columbia Facebook page. So. Sure. Sure. Jim? Um, my experience has been walking on 316s. This is terrifying. I would welcome that opportunity. I've done it many times and regret it every time. Um, I have a question, though. Is there is another, is the concept also allowed for a loop? Then someday. Okay, could you, could you clarify that piece of the puzzle is? Sure. So when when we set out to do this, we gave the engineer essentially a, a clean slate and said our goal is to connect the town hall to the rail trail. Um, and our focus is transportation. Um, that's our objective. So they came back to us initially with two possible routes. One, utilizing strictly town property uh, and going straight back there. But there's a lot of constraints with that. And then the second one was going down Route 316 um, and, and connecting where the, where the trail is now. So the, the first thing we realized is that both of those potential pathways have different funding mechanisms. Um, what we fund going down Route 316, we would, we would fund through a transportation mechanism called LOTSIP, um, which is a transportation capital improvement uh, funding mechanism through the state of Connecticut that is run through the Capital Regional Council of Governments. Um, it funds general transportation projects. The, the problem is for the town of Andover, is that it's, it's geared towards roads that are classified as major collectors and above, and we frankly don't have any. We've got about three-eighths of a mile of this street meets that classification. So the biggest funding mechanism for transportation money in the state of Connecticut, we're locked out of for anything other than a multi-use pathway project which is why we're, we're going for that funding for this, frankly, because you know, it, it's the one peg we fit into for that. Um, at the same time, we are trying for a design grant through the department uh, DEP's Rec Trails program to design a route for a pathway that goes down through here. Now, personally, I don't think it's likely to get funded. Um, my last three rec trails grant submissions that I've put have all been shot down. Um, this one, we're, we're farther along in the planning stage. We have a more definitive plan, and we've narrowed down our route selection, but that's an incredibly competitive grant. So while while we are in the back of our heads planning both loops, I think 316 is doable. I think the trail through the back, through the woods, is probably not doable in the short term. But by proposing that, it makes our 316 grant look better because CROG uh, prefers multi-use pathways that end up in loops. So we're proposing essentially a phase two um, going down there, which would make about a 2.3 mile loop trail. Uh, through the woods. So that's why we did that. Mr. Penn. Um, I think it's a great concept. I, um, um, actually, actually, to me, it creates like a five mile running walking path around the lake. It used to be a road race back in the, in the 90s. That was a race around the lake that was a five mile running. It basically follows that, that same path. So runners and walkers, especially, and cyclists also. Neat five mile path. I think comments earlier about uh, you know if you know that will they come. I, I, I think they will. Like the rail trail. I love riding the rail trail, so I I see 
behavior of use of the rail trail all the time working in my yard. And when that end, when the end of recovery bridge went in, that gap, closing that gap there, oh my god, the use of the rail trail just went 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 up like by a factor of ten. And just like with COVID happened, the use of the rail trail went up by like a factor of two or three. I'm seeing a lot more families out there and stuff. So I think it's one of those things that people will, will take that will you know with that opportunity given to them will will make use of it. It's just my understanding from observations. Thank you. Yeah, and the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, these planning events are for the long term. Um, in about 1970, Holland, you know, as a country started to plan to make the whole country more walkable and bikeable. And when they did it in 1970, the accident statistics in Holland for cyclists and walkers in the United States and Holland were about identical. It was about the same level of risk being a pedestrian in the US as it was in Holland. Now, 50 years later, you know, for every mile walked, you're 11 times more likely to be killed in the United States than Holland because they took a systematic approach to converting the whole country to that. And now that's had a great effect on their GDP just because their number of miles traveled in their car has been reduced a lot because people think of, the, of bicycling and walking as a normal mode of transportation. And if you travel throughout Germany, you'll see the same thing. If you travel to most European cities, if you go through Budapest, same thing, totally walkable, bikeable communities where a significant fraction, if not the majority of the population, uses mass transit and bicycling uh, to get around. So it is possible. Plenty of other places have done it. Um, do I think five years from now, 90% of Andover residents are going to be running around on e-bikes and selling their cars on the Craigslist? No. Um, but it's a start. And, and I think also that we're not talking about putting sidewalks down every road in town. It's not really appropriate. What we're talking about is closing the biggest gaps and solving the biggest transportation issues in town, not going after every little problem. Um, and 316 is definitely one of the bigger problems we have in town. Sir? E-bikes. What's the feeling about e-bikes on these rail trails? Uh, class 1 and Class 2 e-bikes are allowed on rail trails. Um, so for those of you who uh, don't know, a Class 1 e-bike is pedal motor assist up to 20 miles an hour, but you have to pedal. A Class 2 means you've got a little throttle, so you don't need to need to pedal, but it will only go up to 20 miles an hour. And a Class 3 e-bike uh, in the U.S. is up to 28 miles an hour. So the state DEP for the Hop River Trail and their rail trails has allowed Class 1 and Class 2 e-bikes. I would say if you look at the trail now, probably 15 to 20 percent of the people on the trail riding are riding e-bikes. Um, you know, so uh, I don't know. I have it for commuting. Um, you know, it's it's not what I ride when I'm riding for exercise, but if I'm riding for transportation and I want to run down to Dollar General uh, and get a couple boxes of Yobos, it's a great commute. <laughs> <laughs> answer that question. And there are some growing pains with that. One of the problems with e-bikes that those of us who have ridden for a long time have recognized is that uh, somebody who's not a very experienced cyclist can go faster than they ordinarily would without an e-bike. So there's a learning curve with it. And, you know, it's, it's not without any growing pains. Um, but, you know, so far the trail has been able to blend uses. You know, runners, horseback, you know, uh, bicyclists, e-bikes. So I, I think this multi-use path, I would assume, would be the same. We'd allow class one and class two e-bikes on it. Sir, I, I'm one of the major property owners 
but this is going to cross. We met. Yep. I appreciate you coming to the house. Sure. My advice for working hard. I see the change in my plan, which I, you know, I thank you back for. Uh, personally, I've almost been hit crossing Saddlebrook just to get on my driveway coming out of Saturday. Happened to be a couple of years ago. I mean, you, you start to go and somebody can fly around the corner. Um, in that, my wife rides, Joyce rides with her. They come out of my driveway, they have to cross that little piece of stuff before they have to come back in. I am in favor of it. I wonder what it's going to do with property values. Something like this along the front yard. Any, any ideas? I mean, does it increase, does it decrease property values when you build something like this? I mean, the, the only place I know where there's been any kind of systematic uh, discussion of that was Burlington, Vermont, when they put one of the major, they put an urban pathway through, um, which had an enormous amount of opposition. Um, and that has had a positive impact on resale values of the house. Because, you know, if you've got kids, the ability for your kids to go right out the door and be on a safe pathway, um, the ability for somebody with young children to let their kids ride to school every day to elementary school and know they never have to touch a road. So, um, in, I do get it that nobody wants something in their backyard or their front yard, and there's always that concern about the unknown. I remember when the rail trail was going in, our first selectman, you know, Bob Burbank, you know, was absolutely convinced that that rail trail was nothing but an avenue for the local hoodlums to burglarize all the houses down the rail trail. And he was dead set against it, and it was the worst thing that was going to happen in this town. But, you know, he was wrong. And, you know, what I tried to convince him at the time was that the more people to use it, the less problems you have. And I think this will will prove to be the same way um, in time. Will there be some litter? Sure. But, you know, if you ride down the rail trail, there's almost no litter on the rail trail. The only litter you see is where it crosses the road. So it's generally speaking not the cyclists and the walkers and the people on the first path that are causing problems. Is the path going to be Gravel, like uh, it, it will be paved. Okay. It will be asphalt. Yes. There will be none for residents. We're classifying this as a multi-use pathway. And the difference between that and a sidewalk is generally speaking, something that's a multi-use pathway is not a homeowner responsibility. So if you own property there, we're not expecting it to go out and shovel it every storm that's the town's responsibility not yours um, and you know we do have the equipment to do that a little bit of maintain it i mean they don't maintain the, the hot river trail in the winter it's got a little snow nobody's riding their bike on it right in in the hot river trail is a is a linear state park so that that the town doesn't have any control over and that's part of the reason why we haven't plowed um, where we've gone back and done the asphalt path to the rail trail at Long Hill. Because my feeling is, what's the sense of plowing something to an unplowed rail trail? So, um, but this, the, the 316, probably we would elect to plow that in the winter. Um, we have a little Steiner tractor that, that has a blade appropriate for that. I mean, part of the problem is some of the sections of the trail are only six feet wide. Because where we go in front of people's houses, we're trying to minimize the visual disturbance. Um, so we can't plow a pickup truck, it's just too wide. But we do have a little tractor specifically for that. I didn't have questions. Sure. It sounds kind of dumb, but that you like. I've been on a real trail, some people go really fast. So I'm thinking of my driveway and being in my vehicle and trying to get out on the 316. And I'm just trying to visualize, you know, it's like I'm coming down and I've got this thing. I've got to stop there, kind of look, make sure there's no bikes or people. Then I can kind of like sit on top of it, I believe, before I can pull out to go. Sure. And now I'm there and I'm waiting for the traffic and somebody from zipping down on that e-bike. Is there going to be enough 
Kevin can answer that too. I mean, our job is to provide, is to build the trails with appropriate sight lines so somebody's not ripping around the short term. Oh my God, there you are. Yeah, they're slamming the side. So, I mean, it's a very busy spot. Sometimes I don't know. Yeah, no. No, I mean, we can. That's it. That's a question of sight line and design. But yeah, we would design it with sufficient sight lines so nobody's gonna be running into you. I mean, because I could be sitting there, I could be sitting there for minutes. We sure. Could just pull out. And by that time, you know, we could have those just saying it's Yeah, and, and can I guarantee in the next twenty years somebody's not gonna ride down there talking on a cell phone, mm -hmm. not paying attention, and run into you? No, of course not. Just like we had a collision two days ago right in front of, of there, a, a trash truck was turning left on the cider mill right when some guy decided the trash truck was going way too slow and passed him on the wrong side of the road right when the guy turned into the cider mill. All right, I mean, you can do stupid things. And there's only so much you can do to control that. I mean, part of the reason we're putting in the pathway is to prevent these types of things, not, you know, not hurt. Sir? Back to side of mill. With the increased volume of bike traffic or pedestrian traffic, do you foresee the need to have Chevron? Yes and no. And, and I know that's kind of a mealy uh, mouth answer. But what, what we're actually talking about doing is doing a road surface treatment that changes not so much the texture but the visual appearance of a road. Speed bumps? Um, I would prefer not to. Um, well, I for a whole host of reasons. We would definitely do signage. It's definitely a low speed road. One of our constraints on that road is the road itself at its narrowest is only about 15 feet. And technically, a two-lane road should be a minimum of nine and a half feet in each travel lane. However, we have a bunch of constraints because that's an old road, and the houses went in before we really had zoning or anything like that. So the town doesn't really own much in terms of right-of-way, so we can't actually widen that road without going through and, you know, imposing eminent domain and actually painting people's property. And some of the houses are right next to the road anyway. So for practical purposes, we're going to keep it a narrow, low-speed road and do everything we can to indicate to people that this is what we would term a bicycle boulevard. In other words, a very low-speed road that you can expect to see bicycles, pedestrians, and cars all mixing. Um, it does work. Uh, it's not perfect. Would I love to have a separate path through there? Sure, but there's no practical way to do it. Back to side no. Uh, in terms of interest and signage, there's a lot of history. Is there any way to develop some of that? Is that part of the plan, part of the concept, or has that not been approached? It's something we've certainly talked to Scott Yeomans about. Um, and certainly he set me straight on some of my preconceived notions about some of the businesses that were on uh, Cider Mill. Mills. So, Mills, yeah, there were four, I think, along that route. Um, so, yeah, I do think we want to do similar to what we did at Center Street, is to start putting that public interest history up. That's been one of the things I've wanted to do for a while is that we have an awesome museum with a lot of history within the museum, but nobody goes to the museum. And then we have a rail trail with lots of people on it. So why not bring the pictures in the text and some of the things outside so people can see it and it gets to a, a bigger audience. And I would very much like to do that on, on uh, you know, on Cider Mill too, because that is such a cool, you know, pool road in general. Right. So I have a question about the person that's going to hit Sherry. <laughs> um, in terms of 
liability in terms of then what happens, because I'm sure whoever's going to care is going to think they can sue a homeowner. And I'm assuming that that's not true. Homeowners don't need to carry any extra insurance to the town. So it's all that. <laughs> no, I mean, if it is a town trail, it is a town liability. It is not a homeowner liability in any way, shape, or form. You're not on the hook for maintenance. You're not on the hook for liability. You don't need to get a ride around your homeowners because the town decided to put a trail through your property. Um, and actually, one of the things, just those of you who don't know, the, the laws in the state of Connecticut regarding trails on private property are very generous to the property owner. So the property owner, you know, not including anything related to the town, has an awful lot of liability relief just by state law. Because the state law realized a lot of like Medcom that trail goes over private property. A lot of the big, you know, Connecticut blue trail systems is partially on private property. And all homeowners have that same concern. So I, I, I don't think you have any real, real fears in that part. In the back, yeah. hi. Um, my name's Melanie. I live. I live here in town. Um, I rent though. I rent a house on Pine Ridge Drive, and um, I have a son, a seven-year-old son, in a wheelchair. So having something like a paved, like this, would I think is very beneficial for our family sure. because we're looking. I look for things like this all the time. Paved. You know, we're always walking. I mean, we walk down Hendy, which I don't really like, but because people fly down the hill. Um, but we do, we walk to the museum a lot. And that's what we got in the paper that time when we saw you lighting the Christmas tree, we just, yep. we happened to be walking and, and yeah, we like to walk that area, but it's tough in the muddy season, the winter, because it's just a big mud pit and I can't push his chair through that. Um, sure. So being able to access a paved path and be able to go to back to the school and access the playgrounds or even I think there might be one going up down in Long Hill. I think maybe a playground might be going up there, I heard. So rumors. yeah, so the the town currently has a five hundred thousand dollar steep grant to put in both a uh, accessible playground um, at that location near where the soccer fields are as well as pickleball courts for adults and a bunch of other amenities. Yeah, so be able to go from the trails to the library and to the playground, I mean, that would be perfect for us right in town. So I'm, I, I support it. But the thing is though, I rent, so I'm not a taxpayer, so that's the difference. <laughs> but but I, do, I do think it's a great idea. I'm looking to buy a house once the, you know, once they go down, but and I wanna stay in town. And I grew up on 316 in Hebron. So I grew up riding my bike on that portion and it was it was awful so uh, yeah thank, thank you, you. And in the back. so um several years ago i i used to do a loop around the lake and then come up 316 and of course against traffic so i could dive if i needed to to the side not get run over um, then i discovered the woodland trail that goes up through the middle and i've been using that um, when i'm not joint surgery you know free recovery um, but I would definitely use that 316 trail in, in, to do like about a five mile loop around the lake. I look forward to that. But also I see opportunity for the school. Um, uh, my fiance, Christy Hazen, she subs there. She does science stuff. She's used the pond there a few times mm -hmm. and you can access mm -hmm. it from behind. Mm -hmm. But during, during the wet season, it's kind of problematic. And if there's a paved trail, uh, teachers will be able to use that. And if there's an area where we cross the stream, where there's access to the stream, there's a program called Search. Connecticut DEP runs that, where uh, the school kids get down to the stream, turn rocks over, pull up macroinvertebrate insects. You can quantify the, the the purity of the stream based on the different types of groups of insects you find. There's also uh, classes that could, that have been done with cemeteries, old cemeteries, and now kids would be able to access those really old stones and all. I don't know if that's uh, you know, a problem, kids getting into that old cemetery there, but they, they can learn a lot by, by looking at dates and names and things like that. And then you got access also to the, to the uh, history museum. So that opens up a lot of opportunity for this Andover Elementary School that, 
there's there's not much that they have at the moment other than what's in the back there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, and, and one of our goals in doing this is, uh, and it's something that I've had some discussions with Taylor, the principal of the Andover Elementary School, is something called Safe Roots to School, which is a, a federally recognized program that the federal government has been pushing for about 20 years. And that that is to produce an environment where kids can ride and walk to school. I mean, I know as a kid, I grew up in town, a lot of kids my age when I went to elementary school would ride their bikes to the elementary school. Um, I was banned from doing that because my goal as a kid was I could ride anywhere in the north side of town, but I wasn't allowed to ride across Route 6 until I was like 12. Um, you know, now my father would probably let me seeing as there's a crosswalk, but at the time he had no interest in that. Um, so, so I think that's valid. And, and one of the things Taylor talked to me when he, she first came here as a principal is the school system she worked in before, they had a safe groups to school program and they had a walk to work day or walk to school day, bike to school day. And she said she looked around here and she's like, well, I can't find any place we could start. We either start down the lake and then all the little kids have to walk up the hill, which they're not going to be too happy about. Or, you know, I could have them dropped off at the end of Route 316, but the school's only right there. So I, I think that, would, that should be something that works well with the school. Um, we do have bike racks. We, the town paid for new bike racks for the school. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, especially you think in the summer, kids come up and play basketball and stuff like that. You always see kids out there. Hopefully, with a community center, um, you'll see people biking um, and kids coming up here to use the community center and the senior center during the summer when school is out. That's our goal. Anyway. Other questions? I might have missed this from the beginning because I wasn't here. But would this project be funded by all the grants that you're applying for, or will there be money down the road that you have guessed down? So, with a little luck, this will not require town taxes. And I say that because obviously, state grants, federal grants, that's all your tax dollars. That's up my tax dollars, too but it's not town taxation. So the initial funding for this came from legislative appropriation. Um, I actually asked the legislature for money multiple times the last time they said yes. So I was really appreciative for MD Raman um, and the legislator, legislation supporting our request. Uh, so we got enough money to do the initial planning and get us a good way through the design. Um, we have an application in right now uh, for what's called lots of funding, which is transportation funding. I believe that's around a $2.9 million grant. Um, if we get that, that will cover 100% of the construction costs. So are there going to be some costs along the way that we incur? Sure. I can't tell you what they are, but, you know, we're we're probably going to be able to fund 98% of the cost of this. You know, it's, it's not going to be a significant uh, hit on the taxpayer, and we're the ones that are going to get to, to uh, enjoy it and to use it. Did this come to my friend in America? What do you envision that coming for the town? Well, does it have to go before the town? <laughs> um, not unless, so, so the, the way the charter works is if, if I apply for a grant that requires a town match, that has to go to referendum either when I apply for the grant or before we actually accept it and file the final acceptance. So right now we're not asking for any town money. We've and part of the reason why it has taken 10 years is because it's taken me 10 years to get somebody to cough up the design money for this. Um, and we're not going to go through with it until we've got the, the construction funding. So I think we'll, we'll 
I'm sure as part of the design process goes on, we'll hold some more public forums, but I don't think this actually takes a referendum to do. Um, this is like accepting a town road. It's, it's well, no, I take that back. A town road would take a town meeting. Um, I don't actually see anything that this would require a town meeting, but if you can correct me, I'm not opposed to holding 